ready to start. This is Paul, and he's been working on Pearl for over 10 years. And his talk is titled, Awesome Things You've Missed in Pearl. Thank you very much. Now, I do want to start with a small apology. Um, my voice is actually starting to fail on me today, which is very unfortunate. So I'm going to be relying upon the microphone fairly heavily. If you can't hear me at any stage, uh, please, you know, wave or put up your hand or throw something at me. And uh, that will let me know that, you know, I can't, you can't hear me. Now, um, as was mentioned, um, I've actually been working with Pearl for quite a while. And I first learned Pearl, if my slides would change... There we go. I first learned Pearl about 12 years ago now, um, back when I was much, much less cool than I am now. <laughs> now, um, back in those days, uh, I thought lots and lots of things with Pearl were really, really awesome. But what I've discovered is that the things that I thought were good about 12 years ago aren't all that trendy now. In fact, they're not even close to being trendy. So. Perl has improved since then, uh, but not all the people coding in Perl have. I keep encountering an awful lot of people who write Perl like it's the good old days. I find people writing Perl as if it's still 2006. So, I want to encourage you not to write old Perl. I want you to write new, cool, and shiny Perl. And this is going to help you do that. I'm going to show you some of the new technology that we can use. Now, some of you might have seen this book, Pearl Best Practices. Um, it's actually a really, really good book. I helped uh, as a technical editor on the book. It's a great thing if you want to learn about what's good and bad in Pearl. Unfortunately, it doesn't cover the really new technology in Pearl. Um, or if it does, it doesn't cover it in, in very much depth. So that's why I'm here talking about awesome new things in Pearl. So to get started, I want to talk about object-oriented Perl. Now, object-oriented Perl is not awesome. It's not even close to being awesome. The problem with object-oriented Perl is that it's too flexible. There are too many ways of doing it. Now, unfortunately with OO Perl, most of them are wrong, or stupid, or both. The rest of them are too hard. And one of the things, if you've ever worked with object-oriented Perl, is you might notice that it really feels like it's just been bolted on the side. And you've been left to figure out how to make it work. And it, it does work, but it's not ideal. <laughs> now, this is partly due to the Perl motto, which some of you might know as there's more than one way to do it. Uh, that acronym commonly gets pronounced as Tim Toady. Now. To the rescue to solve your object-oriented problems is Moose. Quick show of hands here, who has used Moose before? Ooh, this is good, I've got a good audience here. Okay, the Moose motto is, there's more than one way to do it, but sometimes consistency is not a bad thing either. <laughs> you pronounce that as Tim Toady bicarbonate. <laughs> the nice thing about Moose, it's easy and it is correct. So let's look at what Moose gives us. First of all, hopefully you all know that when you're programming in Perl, you should be doing this, using strict and using warnings. Um, if you're not, you're probably in trouble. Um, when you use Moose, it automatically turns on strict and warnings for you, which means you don't have these two extra lines that you have to type everywhere. But where Moose really comes in handy is when we're writing classes. That's the whole point. So here I've got a class called Hacker. You still spell the class keyword as package in Perl, but I'm building myself a class. I'm using the Moose framework, and then I'm going to have some attributes. To create attributes, I simply say has. So has surname, has given, has username. I now have these attributes, and I also have accessor methods built for them. If I want to, I can specify if they're read-only or read-write. So here my hacker is allowed to change their name as much as they want, but they're not allowed to change their username, because that would be confusing. And I can do type constraints. In this case, all of my attributes are just going to be simple strings. Now, they don't have to be simple strings. If I want to, I can say that a hacker has cheeseburger, which is a Boolean value. 
Then, once I've created my class, and that's what I've done so here, I can then create myself a hacker object. So I use the hacker class, and then I simply call hacker new. Notice that Moose automatically gives me a constructor, and it gives me initializers and deconstructors and accessor methods and all these other things that really you don't want to have to worry about in a proper object-oriented language. If I want to, I could then say that my username is this. Hacker goes to username, and it all works like I want. Now, let's extend our hacker class. Let's make this better. I'm going to have a social hacker. A social hacker can talk to other people. In order for me to have a social hacker, I need to say this extends hacker. So that's how I do inheritance. And uh, this does not need to be an existing Moose class. You can use an old style Perl class and you can still extend it. Moose will figure out how to make that work. In this case, social hackers talk to each other via email. So they have an email attribute. And now I'm done there. I can now create myself a hacker with an email address and I can change the email address. But I've got a really, really big problem. That email address is just a simple string. What if I want to actually validate our email address, make sure they've given me something which is a real email address? Well, to do that, I'm going to muck around with the type constraint system. The type constraint system I can access using this, most util type constraints. And I'm also going to pull in another module called regex common. Regex common allows me to do a whole bunch of useful things with regular expressions. And in this case, I'm using the email address plugin for it. I can then say, I have a new type called email. It's actually a subtype of string. So anywhere I could normally use a string, I'm also allowed to use an email address because it's a subtype. I can validate that by using the regular expression I've shown you up there, re email address. And if that validation fails, I'm going to have this message as an error. So now I've got a simple set of descriptions to say this is what an email address looks like. Then when I go back to my uh, hacker social class, I can say has email, but it now is a email type. And it's now only allowed to be set to valid email addresses, which is pretty cool. How do methods work in Moose? Well, methods in Moose work the same way as they work in any other object-oriented Perl class. So here I've got my hacker class. Here I've just done a little bit of extension. I've added a location for something I'll show you in a moment. And then I've got a subroutine called go outside. So this is a hacker who's not afraid to, uh, to go outside. And it says, have a nice day in location. Now, why am I showing you this? Because Moose gets really, really cool when you start doing subclasses. I'm going to have a SunSmart hacker. Now, we all know in Australia it's important to be sun smart, particularly in Tasmania because we don't have an ozone layer left down here. So, I'm going to have a sun smart hacker and I'm going to use Moose and I'm also going to use the weather Google module. That lets me tell what the weather is like anywhere on the planet. I'm also defining a constant as to what I think is hot. I'm going to extend the regular hacker class, but now here comes the cool thing before I go outside. So using Moose, I can say, before I call this parent method, I'm going to do these things. And there's also an after. After I call this parent method, I'm going to do these things. In this case, I'm going to take my object, I'm going to look up what the weather happens to be, and if the weather is greater than my value of hot, I'm going to say, don't forget your hat. So extending things in Moose is really, really cool. The downside of what I've done here is I've made the assumption that only hackers have hats. And whilst hackers do have some pretty cool hats, as some of you might have seen, um, there are other things which can have hats as well. And we'd like to have other things with the ability to be sun smart. So this is actually a prime candidate for a role. Now, if you've come from other languages, you might also know roles as interfaces. They're effectively something that you can mix into an existing class. To use a role in Moose, I simply say use Moose role. And then I do pretty much what I've done before use whether Google to find my constant, and uh, I say now it requires that you can go outside. So a role can actually have a set of constraints. It says I require these things to occur, or I can conflict with these things as well. And then I write everything else as before. To use a role, very, very simple. I simply say use moose extends hacker with sunsmart. Or if I've got a dog, I can say extends canine with sunsmart. And I can mix this in to uh, any sort of class I want. To give you a final example here, I've created myself a social hacker, I've said uh, hello, and then I've asked him to go outside. And the result of that is it says, hello Paul, have a nice day in Melbourne, which is where I was writing my slides, don't forget a hat. If you want to do more things with Moose, if you want to learn about things you can plug into Moose, there's also the Moose X namespace. 
And if you go to the Moosex namespace on CPAN, you'll find a whole bunch of Moose extensions that you can use. Now, Moose doesn't solve everything. One of the problems with Moose is, uh, sorry, one of the problems with Perl OO is this. Here, I'm using Moose, I've got a hacker, I'm going to write myself a new method called eat. It takes a type of food. What I'm going to do is check to see if that food is a cheeseburger. So I'm calling the is a method on my, uh, my food, and if it is a cheeseburger, then I can say I has a cheeseburger, and otherwise I can just say some default text. The problem with this is that if I pass in something which is not an object, Perl gives me this really annoying thing. Can't call object method is a without a package or object reference. And this is one thing that I really dislike about Perl. Only objects have methods. Or objects and classes have methods. So if you have an array, it doesn't have methods. If you have a reference to something, it doesn't have methods. For years, I've been wanting to do this. Have a reference to an array and say, hey, push this onto the end, because it's a nice syntax. But Perl just doesn't let me do it. It fails. So is there a solution to this? Well, I was sort of complaining about this one day on IRC, and someone said, oh, you know, you can use Autobox to fix this. And I got really excited. I said, that's cool, because I love Optimus Prime. And if Autobots can help me with Perl, then I'm going to be really happy. And they said, no, no, Paul, it's Autobox. So what does Autobox do? Autobox turns everything in Perl into a first-class object. So all of your references, all of your data structures, all of your functions, all your subroutines, everything in Perl is now a first-class object, which means that I thought that I should be able to do that. No. Nah. Why not? Why couldn't I do that? Well, the reason is that whilst everything was now a first-class object, they didn't have any methods declared on them, except for those universal methods. Everything in Perl that's an object has the universal methods. So I can do things like this. I can say that x is a reference to an array, and then I can say, if this is an array, do these things. Or if this is a cheeseburger, do something else. Now, I can always write methods if I want to. Here, I've opened up the array class, and I've said here is a method for push, which simply adds something onto the end of the array, and here is a method for say, which simply prints out what's inside the array, <coughs> with a new line at the end. So now that I've defined some simple methods, I can use Autobox, declare myself an array, push things onto it, and that works. In fact, I can then say push things onto it, and then tell me what's inside, and it actually prints out the array for me, which I think looks really nice. I can do exactly the same thing if that's not an array reference, but an actual honest-to-goodness array that starts with an at sign. It still works. Now, Autobox has lexical scope, which is a fancy way of saying it lasts until the end of the current block or the end of the current file. I can also turn it on and off. So I can say use Autobox, do these things, and then no Autobox. And when I say no Autobox, then everything goes back to as it was before. I can even use Autobox inside a subroutine and enable it just for a subroutine, or if I want to, I can say enable it for a subroutine, but just for this subroutine, arrays act like this class over here. Arrays act like an, a, a, a my array class. Now this actually solves the problem of having a large program where different things want to use Autobox, but use different classes for Perl's primitives. Now, generally writing methods sucks. You can do it, but it's a lot of hard work. It gets very, very repetitive. So luckily for us, it's already been done. There's a module called Autobox Core, which takes all of Perl's core subroutines and autoboxes them for you. So now I can do things like this. Here's my array. I want to sort it and then print it out. And that works just fine. It also makes your code a lot more readable. And this is one of the reasons why I like using Autobox so much. I might have a piece of code that looks like this, which is awful. That's taking a hash, finding the keys, sorting them, reversing them, and printing them out. Now, I would much rather write that like this, because I find that much, much easier to understand. It reads from left to right as opposed to the other way around. There is also, if you're already using Moose, Moose Autobox which does the same thing, but using the Moose framework. And therefore, you can do cool things with extending it. Now, moving along the alphabet, the next thing I want to talk about is Autodie. Now, some of you might have gone to my talk yesterday, the Art of Klingon Program. Just a quick show of hands for me. Who was at the talk yesterday? Ah, oh, some of you. OK, cool. 
Just to give you a quick refresher, or for those people who weren't there, one of my big gripes with Perl is the amount of work you need to do for errors. So here's how I open up a file in Perl, and here is the standard way of checking to see if that's successful. The problem with doing this is that my error code is so much more than my actual real code, which is the work I'm trying to do. And if I'm making lots and lots of system calls, I end up with lots and lots of error code, which clutter up my program and makes it hard to see. So the big advantage of the Autodyne module is I can put it at the top of my code, and now all of Perl's built-ins which can fail will automatically fail with an exception if things go wrong. So instead of having to write that, I can drop it down to that which is much, much easier to read. Like all good things, it also has lexical scope, so you can enable it just for a block. In fact, you can do some really cool things. I can use the eval block in Perl, which is how Perl spells try, and I can use autodie inside it. I can then say, I want to try and do a number of things, and then, given the error that came off that, when it was undefined, there wasn't an error, when it was equal to open, or when it matches open, I know that open failed. When it was an I.O. error, I can do something. When it was a class of all errors, I know it was something else from what I die. And I can also check for legacy errors as well. This here is actually a Perl 510 structure. If you're using Perl 5.8 with auto die, you can still do the same thing, but you use if and else ifs. Auto die also gives you the chance to deeply inspect your error, and I think this is really cool. So here, I'm taking Perl's error variable, and I'm assigning it to a more useful variable name. But I can find out what function actually failed. Was it open? Was it chd? Was it something else? I can find out what was calling that function, so the subroutine that was calling it. I can find out the line number. I can find out the file. I can find out the package where that occurred. And I can even find out the list of arguments. So I can do things like say, OK, my open failed. What file was it trying to open? How was it trying to open that file? And if I use it like a string, I get a pretty printed error message. Now, I think autodie is awesome. I am a little bit biased there because I wrote autodie. I also think that Perl 510 is awesome. And uh, I didn't write Perl 510, although I helped with the release notes. One thing that I think is particularly cool are Perl 510 regular expressions. And these are one of the big reasons, in my opinion, for thinking about moving to Perl 510. Now, you might encounter a scary regular expression in your code. Um, if you see something which looks like this, and you have a bug, you're probably going to have a bad day. Now, if you're lucky, if you encounter code that looks like this, whoever's written it has actually been nice to you. And they've used the X switch to have an extended regular expression. So here, you can see that what I'm doing is I'm trying to parse the output of ls minus l. Hopefully, you're not doing that in Perl. There are better ways to get file attributes. But maybe you're you know, reading something over FTP. You want to parse this out. The problem is that just by looking at this, you can't easily say, what's my size? Was it in $4? Was it in $5? Was it in $6? Which set of parentheses concluded that? What's my match variable? And what happens if my parentheses change? Because then all of my numbers change as well. In fact, you can get some really bad situations. Instead of having something nice which looks like this, you can have something which looks like this instead. Notice that dollar preamble at the top? That's an embedded regular expression. It might contain parentheses, in which case all the numbers change. But you don't know unless you go and try to figure out what's inside dollar preamble. So this can make your life very, very hard, particularly if that comes from another file, particularly if somebody else edits that preamble and your regular expression somewhere else breaks. So Perl 510 to the rescue. One of the great things we can do in Perl 510 is we can have named capture variables. So it's a little bit more typing, but you'll notice that all of my parentheses here now have names, that question mark angle bracket at the front. So I've got permissions, links, user, group, size, date, and file name. It doesn't matter if somebody's got a preamble in here or something else because the names don't change. And I can refer to these results as dollar plus file name or dollar plus size, which is much, much easier to read than say dollar eight and dollar five. It also gets better. Because I can define nice little expressions like this. Here I've got a title which says it's a, a, a regular expression which matches a title, one of these options. And I've said this goes into the title variable. I can then have another regular expression which matches name. In this case, it's just going to be a list of word characters. And it goes into the name variable. Now, I'm using QR to define these, so they're not being run right now. They're just being stored in the variables for later use. And then, Later in my code, I can do this. And 
I have a bug in my code. That shouldn't say QR, that should say M. So I can say, here's my letter. I want to match dear space title space name. And not only do I have a much more readable regular expression now, I know that I'm looking for the word dear, then title, then name, but I can refer to those attributes by name later on, which is nice. It's also really cool if you're doing stuff with grammars. Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but I just want to give you a quick example of how nice Perl 510 regular expressions are. Perl 510 introduces this idea of a define block. A define block inside a regular expression says, here's a bunch of things I want to define, but don't run them yet. So I can say I want to define an expression as being a term followed by an optional op term. Now, when I say dollar amp oh, sorry, question mark ampersand up here, it says that this expression consists of some other expression which has a name. So, an expression is a term followed by an op term. A term is an identifier or a number. An op term is an operator followed by a term, possibly followed by more op terms. An operator is one of these things. An identifier consists of letters and numbers, but has to start with a letter. And a number consists of digits. So now I can actually define a grammar inside my regular expression. And then all I need to do is say, hey, I want you to match an expression at the end there. Or I could simply take this and drop this into regular expressions where I need it and say, hey, I need to match an identifier or I need to match something else. To give you a trivial example of how I might use that, here I'm simply reading in lines of input and saying that looks like an expression if it matches the regular expression I showed you before. Um, that's very, very useful if you're dealing with large data structures and you want to exploit the Perl regular expression to parse them. Now, one thing that I've been using Perl for quite recently is Windows automation. And uh, some of you may have noticed when I was doing my setup, I'm actually running Windows on my desktop here. Now, the reason I'm doing that is because Windows comes with these absolutely awesome killer applications, which is why most people out there are using Windows today. They are quite simply solitaire, and Minesweeper. Now, <laughs> thank you. I love Minesweeper. I actually really, really love Minesweeper. But sometimes I find that I love it a little bit too much. I'll say, oh, yeah, I've got a talk to write for LCA. I'll just play a game of Minesweeper. And then I'll say, actually, I'll play a, minus, play a, play a game of Minesweeper until I win. And I'll say, actually, I'll play a game of Minesweeper until I get a new high score. And then I discover it like the conference has already started and I haven't written my slides. I've got a problem. So I looked at Minesweeper and I said, well, Minesweeper is really a very repetitive task. And what do I do with repetitive tasks that involve computers? I automate them. So I decided to automate my playing of Minesweeper. This would be a great time saver. So I wrote myself a module called App Sweeper Bot. You can grab this from the CPAN, but you can also go to sweeperbot.org. Um, it comes with a video, it comes with a making of, an FAQ, a whole bunch of other things. Um, if you happen to be subscribed to the Perl Review, which only costs like six US dollars a year, um, I recommend uh, looking up uh, the last Perl Review as well, because there's an article in there about how Sweeperbot works. So at this point, I might go to a live demo to show you that Sweeperbot does actually do what I've advertised. Um, I will have to change my resolution here to make sure that it works correctly. So just hang with me just a moment. This should work. Ta-da! So if I fire up SweeperBot, what it does is it starts up a Minesweeper game. It waits for a couple of seconds for things to settle down, and then it starts playing for me. And uh, you can see that it starts off just by guessing, and it kind of sucks. OK, it's kind of sucking a lot here with its guessing. But once it gets going, it's pretty clever. It plays Minesweeper about as well as I do. And uh, away we go through. da -de da -de da And it should complete this, and it looks like it's going to take forever, like 25 seconds or something. And I'll get back to that. But there we go. It's completed Minesweeper. Um, <laughs> thank you. There's a problem with SweeperBot, which is if you don't stop it after it completes a game, it starts another game in five seconds. And it takes full control of your mouse and keyboard. So if you're unlucky, your machine is stuck playing Minesweeper forever. And uh, there was a couple of times during development where that actually happened, that it didn't want to let go of Minesweeper. I'm just going to change my resolution back here and talk about how I got Minesweeper working. So da da Okay. 
So one of my problems with Minesweeper um, is how do I ship my code to my users? There we go. How do I ship my code to my users? Um, because what I'm doing is I've written an application here which is really intended for people who are working on Windows. Now, if I tell people that they're working on Windows and they need a copy of at least Perl 5.8, they need my 1,000 line program, they need a C compiler, they need all of image magic, and they need half of CPAN, they're not going to install my code. They're just never, ever, ever going to install SweeperBot. They're going to play SweeperBot manually, that'll make them very sad. Likewise, there might be problems with compiler issues. Maybe they don't have a compiler, or maybe it's not the same one that was used to compile Perl. Maybe they've got permission issues. Maybe they don't have admin access on their machine to install things. Or maybe they have network issues. I actually have a bunch of clients for Perl Training Australia who, for security reasons, have machines that are not connected to the internet. That makes installing things hard. So, what's the solution for this? The solution is PAR. Now, PAR is the Perl archiver. And PAR is one of my most favorite technologies ever because I can do this. PAR, me hearties. <laughs> so, that's one of the reasons I like PAR. I can pretend that I'm a pirate. But it solves your dependency help because PAR lets you bundle a whole bunch of things. You can bundle up your program, you can bundle up your modules, you can bundle up your shared libraries, your data files, and you can bundle half of CPAN. And you can put all of that into a single PAR file. Now, PAR files are similar in idea to JAR files if you've come from a Java uh, background. But the nice thing about PAR files is that under the hood, they're just zip files. So anywhere that you've got an environment where you can create a zip file, you can also create a PAR file. So on the command line, without any other tools except for a command line zip, I can do something like this. I can take some module, drop it into a PAR file. Then, provided I've got PAR installed, and PAR is very, very lightweight, I can do this. I can say use PAR example.PAR and then use some module. If it's not installed locally, it goes and fetches it out of that PAR file. I can also say use PAR and then put things in by using that libpragma. So it's actually quite cool. I've got different ways that I can do this. And I can also use PAR to bundle Perl itself. So if I'm targeting a platform where people don't have Perl installed, I can actually create a runnable archive. Now to do that, the most convenient way is by using PP, which is the PAR packer. To give you an example of what I can do, I can just write that. PP minus O output uh, hello.exe from hello.pl. Um, if I'm on a Unix system, I'd leave out the .exe. Now that is rather cool because it automatically finds my dependencies. So if I depend upon a module which depends upon some other modules, it'll wrap those up and bundle them up as well. There are some times where it might get it wrong, but there's a few command line options where you can say, hey, don't forget to include this. Now that actually gives me another problem, which is once I distribute this to my clients, I might have different people running different versions of my code. Um, I actually had a friend of mine the other week say, hey, I've got this problem. I'm, I'm using PAR, but I've got all these clients and they're all running slightly different versions of our code. And uh, we'd like to be able to sync them all up. Is there a way that we can do that? Well, you can, because there's this great idea of remote repositories. So you can actually distribute a very minimal Perl program and say, actually, you can find the code for this program over here on some other server. To give you an idea of how you might do that, here I'm using PAR, I've specified a remote repository, and the install one says it's okay to install whatever's on that remote machine onto my local machine. It actually copies the PAR files across and saves them for later use. If I want to manage my re remote repositories, there's a PAR repository module, and it actually comes with some command line tools, such as PAR repo, which does general management, and CPAN to PAR, which lets you say, I've got a CPAN module, please turn it into a PAR file, including its dependencies. If you want really fine-grained control of how you access your PAR files, there's a PAR repository client, and you can use this to do really clever things. I want this module, but I want this module only if it's uh, been built in the last 15 days, and I want to make sure that I check every seven days for updates, or something like that. You can do very clever things with the client. Now, PAR is great for packaging things up, and now that I've got SweeperBot packaged up, I still have a couple of issues. One of my big problems is, as you saw before, SweeperBot is way too slow. It is horrifically too slow. When I want to play Minesweeper, I want to play Minesweeper now. I want a high score now. I don't want to like, go off and make a coffee and come back and have a high score. I just want to have one immediately. 
Sweeperbot typically say takes about 90 seconds to complete expert mode on my machine, which is far too long. My attention span doesn't last that long. So I want to optimize Sweeperbot. Now, the first rule of programming, of course, is you don't optimize your code when you're writing it. And there's a good reason for this. Normally, your programmer time is much, much more expensive than your CPU time. On most, modern mach on most uh, systems these days, it's much cheaper to go out and buy a faster machine than to pay a programmer to spend like a month improving their code. In fact, you're much better off when you're writing your code to have good architecture. Because if you have good architecture, it makes it easy to figure out which bits are running slowly later on and then optimize those pieces. So ideally, we want to optimize when we must. Now, if we discover that we have a situation like Sweeperbot where things are running too slow, we ideally want a profiler to help us optimize our code. A profiler goes through our program and says these bits are running slowly, these bits are running quickly, and these bits are being called most often. So we know which things have the biggest impact on our performance times. The traditional profiler, which people have been using with Perl, is Devel Deprof. And the reason it's traditional is because it comes with Perl. It comes with the Perl environment. But unfortunately, it's a subroutine level profiler, which is really, really 2006. Now, it's good for a few things. It's good for when you have a well-structured code. So you have a really, really good design structure. Things have been broken up into modules. And you have these nice, well-defined subroutines. Because it's a subroutine profiler, it only tells you which subroutines are running quickly or slowly. Unfortunately, subroutine profilers absolutely suck when you have poorly structured code, because it's very hard to figure out what's going slowly. They suck when you have long subroutines, because there might be all these loops and other structures in there which are running slowly. You just get told that this thousand line subroutine is bad. And they also have problems if you have subroutines that vary based upon their arguments. Sometimes you'll have a subroutine which runs quickly all the time, except when it's called with these particular arguments, and then it might run slowly. Now, unfortunately, most of the slow code out there falls into all these bad categories, which means that in any situation where you have to use Devel Deprof, it's always going to suck. So there is a replacement called Devel NYT Prof, and that fixes these. NYT Prof, if you're wondering what the NYT stands for, that stands for the New York Times Profiler. The reason it's called that is because the New York Times actually spent a whole lot of time and money developing this in-house, and then they completely open sourced it. They chucked it up on CPAN. So yes, thank you very much, New York Times. Um, if you're wondering who's working on this right now, it's Tim Bunce, who some of you might have known. Uh, he, write, who, sorry, he wrote and still maintains Perl's DBI module. So you have very, very clever people working on this. The nice thing about NYT Prof is not only does it do subroutine profiling, which is nice in well-structured code, it does line profiling, which is nice in really awful spaghetti code, but it also does block profiling. So anywhere you have a block in Perl, it's profiled. So automatically, all of your loops are now profiled. All of your conditionals are now profiled. Anywhere you feel like adding a block, because you can add a block whenever you feel like it in Perl, it's profiled. So it gives you a very convenient way of saying, this might be running slowly. Chuck some uh, uh, brackets around it, see if it, how fast it actually runs. It also handles hard things, like forks. It handles recursion. And it also handles complex expressions. And I'll show you some of these examples in a moment. If you happen to be running under an Apache environment, let's say you're using ModPerl, there's also an NYT Prof Apache, which can make your life much, much easier in those environments. And it's really fast. Profilers normally slow down your code a lot, but I actually find that NYT Prof doesn't slow it down too much. It's quite amazing. NYT Prof will give you HTML output, which is nice if you're a human, but it also gives you CSV output, which is nice if you're a machine. So it's very, very easy to integrate into other processes if you want to. So let's see some output now. Um, I actually want to show you some example output from Profiling Sweeperbot. So if I switch over to here, Here's an example of what I get when I run NYT Prof. This is the default view. Um, it shows me my top 15 subroutines ordered by exclusive time. Exclusive time is how long the subroutine took, excluding anything else that it called. Now, this is usually the view that you want. But if you look down here, if I can move my mouse properly, all of these ones at the top are things I haven't written. They're all inside Win32 screenshot, uh, or they're inside uh, uh, Win32 GUI test. But there is one there, app sweeper bot value, which is taking a lot of time, and that's something which I wrote. So if I 
oops, zop into here, I can see this, uh, this wonderful display. Now, down the left-hand side, I actually have a few columns. I have the, uh, the number of times something was called, I have the total time that it took to execute that statement, and I also have the average time it took to execute that statement. You notice that some things here are shown up in red. Um, NYT Prof does some statistical analysis. If something falls too far out in terms of standard deviations, it shows up in red, so I can see my hotspots immediately. Now I can see down here that most of my time is spent capturing squares and getting their signatures. So I'm calling off to some other piece of code. But look at this. This really, really makes me happy. This tells me that when I was doing this line, I spent 75 seconds total calling capture square, but I only spent 12 and a half seconds calling image magic get. So if I want to optimize one of those methods, I should be trying to optimize capture square because it's taking the most time. Now, as it happens, when I'm looking at this piece of code here, I can go, well, this is just going to my board, getting back a square of input. Um, what's calling this? Can I reduce the number of times that this whole subroutine is being called? Well, if I scroll up the top here, I can actually see where it's being called from, in this case, from capture game state. And if I click on my line number here, it immediately takes me to that subroutine. I can scroll up a little bit. You can see what's going on. Now, the reason why this is taking so long is this big loop here. For every single board, every single square on my board, I'm capturing every single square. I'm calling this every single time. Now, if I'm playing Minesweeper, only certain squares might change when I actually step on something. So an obvious optimization to this is to not sample the whole board every time, but only sample the things which might change. There is also, if I scroll up here, um, let me just find press. This is the press subroutine, which actually allows me to press squares on the board. And one thing which I think is particularly clever is it shows me all the places which call it and how long they took. So here you can see that I'm calling it from stomp, flag mines, and make move, but it takes about 50 milliseconds each time. If you see 50 milliseconds, 50 milliseconds, and like 1,000 milliseconds, you go, oh, what's happening with that 1,000 milliseconds? And you can look at what's special about how it's being called there. So NYT Prof is really cool. There's a bunch of things I'm not showing you here, but it's well worth the time. So using NYT Prof, I actually managed to get Minesweeper to complete an expert in 11 seconds. And to demonstrate, here's the screenshot. Notice the 11 in the top right-hand corner? That's fast. That's really, really fast. Now. Let's pretend that I've written a cool application like Sweeperbot. I've packaged it up using PAR. I'm about to give it away to the rest of the world. But I'm a little bit worried. I'm not sure if my code is actually all that good. So what's the best way that I can improve my code to make sure that it's actually working well, to make sure it's using best practices? Well, the ideal way is that I would have a code review. I'd find someone else who knows Perl really, really well and who has the time and energy and effort and knowledge to go through my code and give me feedback. Failing that, if I don't have one of those people, um, I might go and grab the Perl Best Practices book and read through that and think about how my code relates to it. But what if I'm too lazy? Or what if I don't have Perl Best Practices on hand? Well, there's this fantastic module called Perl Critic. The great thing about Perl Critic is that it's already read Perl Best Practices. So you don't have to. And you use it with a command line tool. The easy way of calling Perl Critic is like this. Perl Critic sweeperbot.pm. So this is my main sweeperbot module. Now, if I do that, and I just did this the other day, it actually came back to me with this. Sweeperbot.pm, source OK. And I said, well, you know, I actually wanted some feedback here. What's happening is that was running in gentle mode, which means only the most critical violations of style are going to be reported, and I didn't have any. So I want to tell Sweeperbot, oh, sorry, Perl, tell Perl Critic to be a little bit more harsh with me. So I say Perl Critic dash dash stern. There is also harsh and brutal and all these other sorts of things. So please be stern with me. And of course, it comes back with a whole bunch of these errors. Sorry, of these warnings. Um, in this case, it says, hey, you're using this constant pragma. Now, what happens if I don't have the Perl Best Practices book nearby? Well, or I'm too lazy to read it. Well, I can actually say I want to change the verbose mode. There are all these different verbose levels, and you can make your own. So I can say verbose goes to 10, and now, when I run my code, and I won't actually read through all of this, it actually gives me detailed feedback. So I can see all the things which are going on. It gives me detailed feedback about why this is a bad idea, how I can improve it. Now, it's doing a lot of complaining here about constants, but I like constants. 
So one thing I can do is I can actually turn off that particular warning. You notice, although I can't point to it easily here, that after each particular warning, it tells me the class of warning that I've got. So what I can do is simply say I want to exclude that prohibit constant pragma. So for each individual rule, I can turn them on and off. But once I start writing something like this, I've really got a problem of too many options. So luckily for me, I can have a Perl Critic RC file and I can put all of my options inside that Perl Critic RC file. So now when I run my code, it simply gives me a short, useful piece of feedback on something I might want to think about. In this case, it says I didn't end with a true value or I ended with a true value that was too amusing. You can put your Perl Critic RC file in your home directory, which in which case it runs by default, but you can also put them in your project directories. So you can actually say for this particular project that I'm working on with a bunch of people, here are our coding standards, which might be different from what I actually use normally. You can also use Perl Critic to test absolutely everything in a directory. If you run it with a directory name, it recurses through all of it, gives you feedback on everything. And you can build it into your test suite with test Perl Critic, um, which you can look up on CPAN. You can also change your existing rules or you can write new rules as well. So if you have company coding standards, you can build them in to Perl Critic. Now let's pretend that you're too lazy to install Perl Critic. You can also use it to test your code online. So you can go to perlcritic.com, which looks like this, and you can just paste your code in. Now this doesn't let you do all the cool things where you can change options around, but you can pick your severity level, everything from gentle all the way up to brutal. Now hopefully today I've shown you some fairly cool technologies and one thing which I want to emphasize is that when you're working with a cool technology, it's really nice to say thank you. There's actually a whole lot of people out there who go, oh, I've written this cool code but is anyone actually using it? One nice way to say thank you, if you haven't seen it before, is CPAN ratings. CPANRatings.perl.org allows you to rate modules. So you can say, hey, this is absolutely awesome or you can do an anti-thank you and say, hey, this sucks. Um, it's also a good place to find which modules are actually quite good. Um, you might also want to consider emailing the author, and if you're using a new version of Perl, so if you're using Perl 589 or 5101, which will be released soon, there's actually a Perl thanks command. And Perl thanks is like Perl bug, but instead of saying, hey, there's a problem with Perl, you can say, hey, there's something good about Perl, and uh, send that in. So hopefully, using all these tricks, you can now code like it's 2009, and you too can be really, really trendy, just like me. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. I think I've got five minutes, four minutes left for questions. Any questions? Yes. Sorry, could you repeat the question? There was cruel mode, yes. Does it insult you? No, no. Um, it does get very picky about things. It says, oh, you should be using like four space indents and you've got a cuddled else and all these other sorts of very, very picky things. But no, it doesn't insult you. But you can edit Perl Critic, so it does, if you want to. Yes, Mark. Perl Tidy. Perl Tidy is good if you want to, the question was any comments about Perl Tidy. Perl Tidy is good if you've got a whole lot of, of uh, Perl code and you want to reorganize it to use a particular style. Um, Perl Critic is useful when you're not just talking about making space changes, but when you're actually talking about um, am I checking return values of my functions, um, am I forgetting to do important things with my modules, am I doing things like using prototypes, which is usually a bad idea. So Perl Critic is really designed more at the code review thing as opposed to the automatic uh, formatting thing. Um, there is actually a, a new editor out there, which I didn't mention, called Padre. Um, and while I won't go into too many details, Padre actually has Perl tidy like functionality, but you can enable it just for a block of code. So you can say, just for this subroutine that I'm editing, please tidy just this subroutine, which is very, very cool. Any other questions? Yes, up the back. Do you have reflection in the Perl object model? The answer is yes if you're using Moose. Um, the Moose guys are really, really big on meta object models and they use the common lisp object model and all these other sorts of things. So you've got this fantastic level of, re of reflection if you're using Moose. Without Moose, probably not. 
Oh, lots and lots of questions. Yes. The question is, should every CPAN module have a PAR file? I uh, don't have an opinion on that yet. I'm very, very sorry. So I'm, I'm not going to state an opinion with that one. I have to do my research. Um, I think we had another question over here. Can that be allowed to use methods? Method swizzling. Method swizzling. Oh, yes, you can. Um, the, so if I've got an existing class and I want to be able to do something where I call its method and my own, if you're happy to inherit from that class, yes, you can. So you make your own subclass and you inherit from there. There are some clever things which you can do where you can sort of dynamically replace it, but I don't know if Moose will help you there. I haven't tried. Um, also known as um, monkey... Okay. Yep, yep, monkey patching. Um, I don't know how well Moose helps with monkey patching, but grab me afterwards and we can check. Cool. Any other questions? There were a bunch. Yes. 5.10.1, yes. The question was, what if this is going into core? Um, auto die is, the rest isn't. Um, one of the reasons for that is that when you put things into core, it ends up being covered in molasses. Um, because doing things with core takes a lot of work. And so unless you have a very small, well-defined module, putting into core not only makes the core bigger, but also makes it harder to work with. So auto die is nice and small and easy, so that does go into core. The rest of it tends to be a bit bigger, so it's not going into core. Any other questions? Yes. The question was, with named regular expressions, can you have multiple parentheses with the same name? And the answer is yes, you can. Um, there's another special variable which you can use called percentage minus, which allows you to access all of them. So by default, you just get the last one, but you can actually access all of them if you want to, if you've got multiple ones defined. And I suspect I'm going to run out of time for questions. Can I take one more? Oh, okay, there's something going on in here, so I better clear the stage. So thank you all very much. I'll be sticking around for the rest of the conference. So if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them then. Thank you.